Hello, everyone. We're going to get started right away. We're going to do the full 30-minute panel, and then we're going to do a short Q&A and go right to lunch because we're running a little bit behind. As an aspiring businesswoman who hopes to one day reach C-suite level, I can't believe I'm standing on stage with these four successful businesswomen and industry leaders who are innovating and shaping their respective companies and industries. I'm honored to introduce you to our dynamic business panel that will be moderated by Katie North, a senior finance analyst at Bloomberg Government. There, Katie conducts extensive research on the Dodd-Frank's laws implementation and quantifies how it impacts business and industry. Our three panelists are marketing mavens whose strategies have significantly contributed to their company's bottom lines, an image that we all know today. We have Anne Finucane, who is the Global Strategy and Marketing Officer at Bank of America. In her role, she oversees marketing, research, advertising, and communications organization. She directs Bank of America's engagement and position on global and domestic policies, current legislation, and other public affairs issues affecting Bank of America globally. She also oversees Bank of America's Corporate Social Responsibility Program. Next, we have Rochelle Parham, who is the Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer for eBay of North America. In addition to overseeing eBay's marketing activities, she also directs eBay's Women's Initiative Network for North America. This program inspires and develops eBay's female employees to prepare them for leadership positions on their own. Last but not least, we have Jacqueline Parks, who is the first ever to hold the title of Chief Marketing Officer at Major League Baseball. There, she promotes the league's brand by overseeing advertising, marketing, promotion, research, design services, and community relations. Her efforts have increased the worldwide recognition at the Major League Baseball, at Major League Baseball logo and brand that we all know today. We are so excited and grateful to have all of you with us today. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our panelists, panelists and moderators. Thank you so much, Ava. I appreciate it. And thank you to all of you for putting together this wonderful program. Um, I feel so privileged to be able to speak with these wonderful ladies on stage today. Um, I'd like to get right into the questioning and, and ask the panelists, how did you get involved in marketing and strategy? Did you always think this was going to be your path? And also, can you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a CMO in your company? Because oftentimes that can be very different depending on who you are. Let's start with you, Anne. So uh, the way I got, uh, I've been at this a long time and it was uh, one step in front of another as opposed to a grand plan. I began in city government, uh, I did public information, I went on to television, from there I went to advertising, then consulting, and then went to a company, became a CMO, and then took on extra responsibilities. So, bit by bit. Rochelle? So uh, I always knew I wanted to do marketing. At the time, when I was in high school, I didn't really know what that meant. I knew that there was cool stuff that happened on TV and showed up in magazines, and I knew that someone was responsible for that. Uh, I didn't know what that was, and, but I knew I wanted to do it. I uh, went to school. I was in the, uh, went to Drexel. I was in the business program with a concentration in marketing, so I knew I wanted to do marketing. Uh, like Anne, I was in uh, advertising. I worked for Digitas, a leading digital advertising agency. I was there for about 13 and a half years. I ran consumer marketing at Visa, and then I uh, became CMO at eBay. And so in my role, I own the global brand strategy. I am responsible for our global brand council. I run global internet marketing. I run global CRM, and all the marketing for North America, in addition to our uh, our global corporate citizenship work as well, eBay giving works as well as all the work that we do in green. And I lead our Women's Initiative Network, as you said. What about you, Jacqueline? Well, first I just have to say thank you to Helen and to Kendall. I mean, this is just an unbelievable group of people that you've put together. And you know, we came here to support you, but I leave today inspired by what I've seen and by the movement that all of you are a part of. It's just incredible. So much like Anne, I didn't really have the vision coming right out of school that I knew I was going to be in marketing. Um, marketing didn't really even exist as an area of focus in college. Uh, really, I followed passion in terms of aligning myself with brands and companies that I felt really good about. Prior to working at Major League Baseball, I worked for a brand that I know every one of you love. Uh, as much as you love Major League Baseball, that's Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy. Um, <laughs> and really had the privilege of working for organizations uh, like baseball, like Jim Henson, that have an impact on people's lives. And it was very interesting to hear what Maria and, and Steve and Jean had to say today about impact. Um, so I really followed passion and having a chance to make an impact uh, to, to where I am today, and that's, that's how it got me to Major League Baseball. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe we could also hear a little bit about sort of what your day jobs are like. What's the mix between sort of creative tasks that people think of related to marketing versus more of the strategy and analysis piece versus since you are in the C-suite level, what, what amount of time do you spend on management activities? And maybe we can start with you, Anne. Well, I, I have maybe a little different job because I don't, um, banks are, are, are complicated entities and the financial services has certainly been in the crosshairs of both legislation and, and uh, regulation. So I spend more time there than probably most people would, um, dealing with the public policy issues and um, uh, some CSR issues that come out of that. So I split my day with marketing. We had a, one program that I'm particularly pleased with, which is a, um, a program we did with Red and U2 earlier this year, and a Super Bowl spot that we ran that was um, for every dollar that, uh, for every person that downloaded a song for free on iTunes, we would uh, donate a dollar, and within 24 hours, we were able to uh, donate $3 million in just 24 hours. The reason I liked it, it was the ability to work with some other brands, Visa, iTunes, obviously, Red, and then uh, the band, and to uh, take a complex situation and, and create some, um, uh, I think, generate some good action. So that was an unusual thing, given that most days I'm dealing with uh, sort of heavier lifting around regulatory issues or marketing products. So for me, there is no day that's the same. Every day is completely different with a brand new challenge or a brand new opportunity. Uh, I, I've been doing a lot of work recently on uh, just our global brand strategy. So for those of you who are on eBay, and I'm hoping that every single one of you is on eBay. Uh, you might know us as uh, what we used to be, which was all about kind of auctions and, and people that sell their kind of used things on our platform. And now we really are very, very different from them. And so I spent a lot of time helping uh, to shape what that global brand strategy ends up looking like and, and help people every day understand kind of what the new eBay is. Uh, I have a team of about 190 people or so, and so they're all focused on lots of different parts of, um, of what we do in marketing. And then, you know, just like what, what Ann just said, a lot of the, the fun things that I get to touch are the, the places where we get to give back. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a lot of people don't know, but we uh, are one of the only companies that has actually built giving into our platform. And so uh, I get to do a lot of cool things with a lot of cool artists. So you guys probably know Pharrell Williams, and you know that he wore that kooky hat at the Grammys. And, and I spent three weeks getting him to, uh, to finally put the hat on eBay, uh, which, which sold for uh, uh, his charity, which went for about $44,000 for a hat that he you know, paid $200 for. So um, I, I have a lot of fun doing those types of things that, that ultimately help a lot of people, which is great. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline? So marketing has changed so much, right? So the, the whole big data and the influx of intelligence and what consumers want and what consumers demand and what they need is just right at our fingertips here all the time. So we're really at a special time, baseball, because we're able to take all the social input and the comments and take that data and use the money ball of the baseball operations and apply it to the money ball of marketing the game. Really, um, the consumer is driving what we do. So no day is the same like Anna and Rochelle. Uh, said to you, um, but we have a really big opportunity every day to create change. Our product is a real, breathing, living product. Uh, because of that, there's opportunities and then there are challenges. Uh, the consumers give us input. It helps us navigate what best to do for them um, and then what to steer away from in some instances. Um, but it, it's, it's a unique opportunity because you're able to take that data and you're able to create impact. And so one of the programs that we're so proud of at Major League Baseball is the work we do with Stand Up to Cancer. Um, Stand Up to Cancer is an unbelievable global organization that's created dream teams. And I'm particularly interesting to talk about because it's uh, founded by eight women. Um, and those women really changed the paradigm of the way that cancer research was approached. Um, instead of in silos, they approach it as collaboration. So they created these dream teams. And at baseball, we've um, partnered with them and we've marketed with them, but much more important at baseball than just marketing, we feel, is the giving back and being very transparent in our actions. So whenever you see us painting something pink or holding up a sign, you know that Major League Baseball has given probably 10 times more than they've marketed to that cause. And I think for all of you as you move forward with cause marketing and philanthropy being at a crossroads with marketing, just really be careful and be very smart about how you look 
at um, what you're saying to the consumers and make sure the giving part is a whole lot stronger than the marketing part. Um, so every day is different and it's great. Yeah. I suspect many of the ladies in the room are interested in pursuing a career in strategy or marketing. What's one piece of advice you would give them as they start to enter the workforce? Anne? Uh, well, I think you have to be a lifelong learner. I know that sounds sort of corny, but the truth is, particularly in these jobs, because you're at the nexus of what the company is producing and then what um, you're uh, expressing to the rest of the world, including your own employees. So you have to understand the business, um, soup to nuts, and then you have to understand the external world and you need to be able to create energy and um, data and outcomes that are based on the business goals, but also b based on what's a win for the consumer base or your audience. And that makes you a lifelong learner. You have to stay current with uh, every trend. You have to be uh, endlessly curious, and you have to be uh, willing to take some risks inside your company because you are not the person that comes in every day producing something. You're the person coming in and expressing how that will go for the rest of the world. So I agree with that. So when every time I join a, a new company, I spend a lot of time understanding uh, that company, how it works, you know, frankly, how it makes money. Uh, and, and then the other side of that is really understanding the customers. And so uh, I always go on this journey to get as much customer insight as, as I can. But for me, I actually like to meet the people. And so I spend a lot of time with our selling community, uh, with kind of everyday people who uh, make their living on eBay. You know, they pay their mortgage and their car payment and all these things things on eBay and they look for us in our platform to, to help them to do that. So spending time with them, understanding their wants and their needs, but also trying to figure out how to anticipate their needs has been incredibly important for me. And then there's a wealth of data and insights that we get through qualitative and quantitative research. And, and for me, I, I spend a lot of time understanding what that path to purchase is, like what does that really look like in that customer journey, and, uh, and how do I help to really influence and change the behavior of customers. And so getting that insight and understanding that data really helps me to, to be smart in what I do. And it's really foundational because it helps you to, to really path out what it's going to look like for the next three years or five years. And, and it ends up being incredibly impactful. Yeah, I would just say make sure your path is open. A lot of people talk today about you know, not narrowing it down to be living within a box. Um, so when you look at marketing you know, and you're t starting your journey, um, make sure you're looking at everything on the side as well as what you're looking at as your goal ahead because it may be the things on the side that are the most interesting to you. Um, definitely the insights and the intelligence really know your product. Um, and, and whatever you do, I really, I'm, you know, if you ever hear me, it's all about passion. You have to love what you do. If you love what you do, you can put everything you have into it. It drives you to stay up till 1 o'clock in the morning and then wake up at 3 because you thought of something different. Um, and, and today is just an incredibly exciting time to live in because of the fact that there's so much opportunity through technology that exists. And so as you're, as you're starting or if you're looking at marketing, you know, just make sure you're looking broad enough and that you don't you know, not look at things that are on the side and uh, take advantage of the endless opportunities that are there that are not the traditional opportunities of maybe the C-suite that everybody's calling. You may create your own suite and that might be a whole lot better. So interestingly, one of the, I often get asked the question of, you know, how did you get to where you are? Or what does it take? And, and people say to me, like, what do you do next? And then what do you do? And then what do you do? And, and how I like to describe it is, um, I don't think you have to know the next thing. I think you have to know the ultimate thing. And so you have to declare. I believe that people need to declare what they want. You know, so I declared a long time ago I wanted to be a general manager, and then I declared later that I you know, thought I wanted to be a CMO. And then really all the things I did next were, were things that I was able to put into my toolbox, mm -hmm. the things that I would be able to touch on uh, later and in the future that actually helped to lead to that thing. Uh, and, and then I met people along the way that actually helped me to define what that might look like. Uh, but it wasn't deliberate, like the next step and the next step. What was deliberate is the declaration of what I wanted to do in the future. Absolutely. I think a lot of people phrase it as a jungle gym versus a career ladder. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, I know Lois Marie Slaughter talks about having a series of plateaus in your life as you develop your own career. Um, sort of, what do you think it takes to, to get to the C-suite level, though? If, uh, aside from just setting that as your goal, what are some of the real qualities that, that you think belong sort of at the C-suite level? 
you answer first. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I do believe you have to take a, a lot of risks. I think that is um, one of the things that I've been been really figuring out, and I speak to a lot of women, and I and I lead our women's network, so I, I get these questions that are about like really what does it take, and. And what I find is, and we talked about this earlier, is that men and women are really very different, and the path for women often feels a little different than the path for men, and it's, and it's just because of how women are wired and what we do. And so, you know, we, we talk a lot about mentors and sponsors and all of these things, and, and what I realized and what you know, a lot of research shows us is that women often have a lot of mentors, people that they can talk with. Uh, and the challenge is women often don't have sponsors, and sponsors are people who talk about you, right? So mentors talk with you, sponsors talk about you, and having sponsors is not that easy because you can't really walk up to someone and ask them to be a sponsor. It, it just happens because they see you do incredible work, they see you taking risks, they see you uh, really kind of striving to do that next thing, and, and so I've learned over the, over the years that I actually have some incredible sponsors. But at the time, I didn't know where they were my sponsors. I know now who they are. Uh, and I call those people my personal board of directors. And uh, so you guys know what a board of directors is. These are the folks that kind of are advocates for a company, and they help to support the CEO or president of that company and kind of driving that business and you know, really acting as a consultant for them. And, uh, and so I have a bunch of consultants for Rochelle. I am a brand, and my brand is important, and these people care about my brand, and, uh, and they help me. They help me make really smart decisions about kind of what's next for me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I've been fortunate enough, and, and I think that as I think about the path to, to Rochelle's C-suite, it really came down to finding uh, great opportunities, uh, definitely taking risks, as Anne said. Uh, some things felt a bit impossible, but uh, they were things that I could achieve and, and do, and, uh, and listening to people along the way to figure out kind of what's the right next thing. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely talk more about sponsors and mentors in a, in a little bit. Um, Jacqueline, do you have anything additional to add on sort of your path to the C-suite and what you think it takes to get there? Yeah, I mean, I just think it's results, results, results. At the end of the day, um, it's all about what you deliver, and it's being the person who works harder, that tries more, that's smarter, that is um, a collaborator, that brings people in. I mean, today is an example of collaboration. Helen and Kendall are here, but they wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the collaboration of a lot of other young women and men who helped this event happen. And so I think you know, it's really, really important um, you know, that you have that focus on collaboration along the way. But it's all about results, and if, if you're driven to succeed, you'll get smarter, you'll work harder, and uh, you'll get to the top. And you talked a lot about continuous education. Is there anything else you would add to that as, as sort of what's gotten you on your path to the C-suite? Well, I th continuous education to me does not, not have to be a formal element. It is um, understanding the business you're in, curiosity about the world around you, and making sure you're mastering it. So it is um, learning uh, educationally, but it's also uh, applying yourself to learning your business, uh, creating a network of other people that you work with who may be better at something in finance or um, in operations and making sure that you understand that well enough so that you can inculcate it into what you're doing because it, it will give you an advantage. And I do think, uh, talking to what Jackie spoke earlier, the use of data is, is such a major element and it can focus so effectively that the better you understand the funnel and what's possible, and the more curious you are, and the, the more vulnerable that you leave yourself to say to somebody else, I don't really understand that, can you teach me it? Um, which very few people do, and no man does it. So, um, <laughs> as a woman, I think you have an advantage to say, I, I really need to learn that, and I'm not sure I understood it in the last meeting or what I read, because it's, it's a secret weapon that you can use, and we have to be better um, as a gender, I think, in, um, in all ways in order to make sure that we're going to be in a position to be promoted to the next job. Absolutely. I know in the, the previous panel they talked a lot about taking risks and how women generally, in a, in a very general sense, maybe don't take as many risks as men. Um, does that play into, you think, your pathways? And also a side question on that, um, the pathway that you've chosen, do you think 
uh, it's better to specialize or to really generalize in a topic as you start out on your career. You know what, I'll start with that. I mean, it's interesting because I actually have always felt in my life that it's easier as a woman to take risks. Uh, the generation that I grew up with, men have had such pressure to be the you know, breadwinner and the one that's supposed to be getting the big job. Um, I didn't feel that same pressure. It was almost as if I could exist on the side and keep working as hard as I could without that. So I took the risks. I pushed myself further. I worked harder. Um, so I, you know, I, I just feel like as it's, it's individual to each person. Um, women take risks in different ways than men do. Um, they may not be as open or vocal with it. Um, but, but nonetheless, I think that you know, we shouldn't silo ourselves into not risk takers, because I think there are a lot of risk takers. Fair enough. Rochelle, do you have anything to add? Uh, it's, for me, as it related to marketing, I, I do have to say that I've pretty much touched every part of marketing. So I, I started my career in teleservices. I went on to do direct marketing, direct mail. You guys don't know much about that. It was way before your time. Um, you know, it, was, it was in digital really early in, in 1997 or so. And so I'm, I believe that at least for me and, and what I was able to do, um, having a bunch of different experiences has really helped me. I know people who have kind of stayed in one lane and, and that really works for them, but, but that concept of building my toolbox is, it's about having a bunch of different skills that I can touch on that helped me along the way. And so when I think about all the things that I was touching in my, as I moved up the corporate ladder, all of those functions exist under my current role. Mm -hmm. And so just having um, some idea of how they work and what, and what it takes to actually kind of move the needle in those areas um, is, is important. So being able to touch a lot of things has helped me. So generalizing can be a really strong yeah, tool. It, it's helped me, yes. What about you, Anne? Anything on the risk-taking or the specialization versus generalization? Well, um, I'm comfortable with risk, so I, I, I've always liked it, but I think there is, um, that's different than being um, impetuous. It's, it's about being um, deliberate and thinking about it. So if you see life as sort of a chess board, which I do, um, I take risks, but they're calculated, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. So I think that the trouble with risk isn't the taking it, it's the consequence on the other side of it that it doesn't always work out. And you gotta be good with that. Yeah, right. you have to be prepared. Absolutely. I know a lot of the ladies are probably thinking about their resumes and how they're gonna plan to get their first job. Um, all of you supervise lots of different people in your organizations. Do you have any pitfalls or suggestions that you would share with the, the audience about their resume or their cover letter and how they should have that as a tact? So, that, so this just came up for me. Uh, someone asked me the question. It was, um, I was speaking at Parsons in New York on Tuesday, and the person said, well, what do you think about the cover letter? I was like, oh, I haven't seen a cover letter in so long, but, but I think it's because you know, my recruiting team and all these things, but I do see the resume. And it really falls back to what Jacqueline said. It's about results. You have to be clear on what you've been able to accomplish. I mean, if you imagine, you know, I have... 50 resumes in front of me. I'm trying to cut through to the, that one or those one or two people that'll be kind of great for this new opportunity. And and what I look for is people who've actually accomplished things, uh, because you're going to show up and you're going to have a great resume. But what did you actually do? Uh, and you know how are you going to cut through? And then I'd also say it's it's about bringing your personality. You know, so when you're in front of uh, in, in in an interview. You have to bring you, and so you have to practice. You have to practice telling your story uh, and being able to tell it in a way that's compelling and exciting and succinct and, and to the point, because sometimes you're up against a whole bunch of people whose experiences look just like yours. Uh, and so sometimes it's about how is this person gonna fit into my team? What are they gonna bring that's really special and interesting? And so it really is that mix and balance of results and kind of bringing you to the equation. Jacqueline, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, each one of you are a brand, and so as you look at internships and job opportunities, the brands that you'll be putting on that resume are equally as important, so that when you are looking at that stack of people, you look at, okay, well, Bloomberg, that's an amazing brand. That's somebody I want to take another look at, Bank of America, eBay. When you're aligning with companies, whether it's an internship or a volunteer opportunity, think about how that is a statement for who you are um, and what you stand for. And, and the experience that you put underneath it, as Rochelle said, is equally important 
Um, the, the opportunity to have a job interview, it, some of the pitfalls that I think that I think would be important to share. I have a lot of super smart people come in and tell me why they think this is a great job for them. And I'm sitting there thinking, and why do I care? Um, you're supposed to be selling me on why you're the right person for the job. And so I think it's just really important that you know, you're selling yourself, you are a brand, and, and you think about it through the lens of what can I add to this person's team? Why would I, why would I be somebody they want to bring in? Um, and you may in your head be thinking, this is, this is good for me, and that's, that's obviously really important. But, but think about it as what are the skill sets or the things that you think you can do uh, that take you over the top for that, for that job. However, I think it is hard when you're younger to know what your brand is. Right, true. Um, and um, I mean, you're graduating from college or graduate school, you've got student loans, you need the job. Um, my own feeling is, is that find some way to network that you get interviewed, that, that you, um, and that mean, it, it doesn't mean sometimes that the resume sticks out, although that would be good. I think that there, you might know somebody in the company who can put in a word for you. So if you have the credentials, so you have to have the credentials, you have to know what you think, but it's really useful if you can get somebody to say something on your behalf, because let's face it, realistically, it's very hard to cut through. Yeah, that's that sponsorship piece, right? Yeah. That's someone who speaks for you. Um, I know Georgetown does a lot of research on this topic about getting women involved in corporate boards. How can we do more? It's a, it's a dismal you know, number of, of women who are actually involved in this. I think most of you guys have experience on that. Um, be, being on corporate boards, what have you learned and what has it, how has it helped you in your career? Uh, well, it helps enormously because you're seeing what other companies are doing. And I work at a company where we have a lot of diversity on the board, both people of color and um, uh, women. And the executive management team is 40% women. So what, what makes a difference is getting a start and then keep going with it. And um, in terms of boards, I think that, uh, I mean, certainly I've learned a lot, but it's mostly about learning another business. How did you initially get involved? When was the, the first time that you initially were tasked with, with coming onto a corporate board? Uh, just a few years ago, we, but only because in my company you can't, couldn't go on a board until recently. But nonprofit boards are, are the way to start and to get a okay. sense of governance and committee work and making a difference. Okay. Rochelle, what about your experience? So when I was looking for board opportunities, um, I first had the sponsorship of my CEO, so that really helped. Uh, he uh, helped me to identify some really great opportunities. And what I was looking for were two things. One, where I could learn. I wanted to, you know, because you're giving up a bunch of your time, uh, and so I wanted to make sure that I was going to really learn from that experience and that it honestly was something I could put in that toolbox I talked about before. But I also wanted to make sure it was a, a company that uh, I could actually deliver something where my expertise would really be valued. And so um, it's been an incredible experience for me. I've been on uh, this board now for almost two years, uh, and, um, and I've learned a lot. And it's a lot of work. It really is. But it's, um, it's been a great experience and opportunity for me, to Anne's point, to actually see another company and to see the challenges that they're faced with and to be able to help in shaping some of those opportunities mm -hmm. has been a lot of fun. Very good. You know, I've actually been approached by a lot of headhunters about boards, and I've chosen not to sit on boards. Um, mother of three children that are still relatively young, 12, 14, and 16. I've uh, chosen to be on mother's committees uh, within the schools that my children work for, and I think maybe at a later point in my career where I could give the focus and dedication that I think is necessary to sit on a board, I'll take a look at it, but right now, I've got my uh, hands full with my job and, and my three children and their, their various uh, activities. So. I've chosen not to because I don't. I, I just don't feel like I could give 200%, and I wouldn't want to align if I couldn't. Yes, great. Um, so let's let's move the conversation a little bit more towards the community of women and how you can um, leverage women in your companies. But also, um, what in your mind is is the real difference? We talked about this a little bit between a mentor and a sponsor, and who have you relied on in your careers in either area? Yeah. Um, well, I do think. Um, to Rochelle's point, they're different. So mentor, to, this is my own interpretation. Mentors are people that can provide you with advice and you provide them with advice. So they can be uh, someone above you, beside you. Um, you can, they can report to you. They can be another uh, woman, another mother, 
a call, to me it doesn't matter. It is a matter of uh, taking their wisdom and trying to provide your own to them so that it is, it's a, it's a um, sense of moving forward. Sponsorship is different. Sponsorship is somebody that's got the, their hand at your back and helping you move along. And um, I think that is part of, uh, you do a really good job and people notice you. Uh, it's also sometimes helpful to remind them that you would like them to notice you and you would like them to speak up on your behalf. And sometimes with women, at least, um, I've maybe been at this a little longer than others, um, that you have to do a little self-advocacy on that, yes. on that. I agree. So um, I think that, you, so I, I spend a lot of time with the women at eBay and I do a, a lot of talks and, and often I hear the same things which are, uh, what does it take to get ahead? Who helped you along the way? How do you think about mentorship and sponsorship? How do you think about self-advocacy? And the questions actually don't change, which is so interesting. Uh, and, and it's because as women, we still have so much work to do. Uh, and, and I agree that it's, it's important to have mentors, uh, but as it relates to your career and helping to drive your career, the sponsorships really do, really do matter. These are the people who talk about you in calibration sessions and promotion nominations and uh, at board tables and all of these things. And so having sponsors is, um, is incredibly important. And, and remember that the sponsors are people who really actually care about you and your success. And, but it requires them to understand you. It requires them to understand what you want to achieve, uh, what your goals are, what you're good at, the areas that you have development areas for. It really requires them to understand a little more. And so uh, it, it's an investment, and it's an investment that they're putting into you. And so it, it is uh, an incredible part of the equation. And, and what I'd love to see is um, is things like this, where women are supporting women and, and really helping to, to continue the dialogue so that we can continue to achieve and grow together. It's, it's incredibly important. But the other part that's also important, and it was brought to the table before, is you have to have men in the conversation. Right. Because the only way women can be successful is men have to be successful too. Like We have to do it together. Uh, and men have to understand the challenges that women are faced with in the workplace uh, because they can help in making things different and better. And so a lot of the things that I've done specifically for our women's network is actually included men in the dialogue so they can hear. We are wired differently, our brains work differently, there are all these things, but, uh, but we have to do it together. Jacqueline, yeah, I mean, for you? me, just to build on that, including men, every door that's open for me has been opened by a man. Um, and so I've learned a great deal from men who have a really fair shake about how they think about women's role in the workplace. And um, I think it's really important to have mentors. Um, I think it's very important to have sponsors. I think it's really important to make sure that you're working for companies and people that you feel good about, um, both in the results that they're producing and the, the business ethics that they have. And that's really an important thing in today's day and age to really align yourself with leaders that you feel are genuinely good people and are doing good things. Um, so very fortunate to have had, had that in every stage of my career. And um, you know, I, I think, as, as a woman, sometimes it's harder to put yourself forward, so the sponsor is so, so important because, as I've said, I'm all about risks and results, but sometimes it's hard to be the one to advocate for yourself and to ask for more and to have somebody who's right there saying, you totally deserve it, you owned it, go for it, you can have it, it is unique. I'm lucky to have that in the job I have now. Mm -hmm. Also, you have to wear black. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, all the time. I blew it. I did blue today. It was like a big step out, as Tim will tell you for me. <laughs> uh, well, a lot of folks like to talk about work-life balance when they start to think about their careers. I know for me, I'm trying to finish my MBA here at Georgetown while working full time. So the balance for me is pretty difficult. Um, but I'm curious to know you, you all's thoughts on sort of is does the phrase work-life balance mean anything? As it is it a, a fair statement? Um, and, how do you, and if so, how do you achieve it? Well, um, I have four children, three stepchildren, so um, I have a lot of work life to balance. <laughs> um, and um, I th so this is my feeling. It might be, I think it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and therefore you have years that you're going to pedal forward, and days, weeks, months you're going to pedal, pedal back. And, um, it is, to Rochelle's point, where you're trying to get to, not every day is a great day. You just have to sort of get up and start again. 
And I, I, we talk a lot about balance, this notion of work-life balance. I don't think about my personal life that way. I, I actually think in terms of priorities. And every day there's a different priority. Sometimes it's about like hanging out with my mom who's here. And sometimes it's about hanging out with my boyfriend. And sometimes it's about uh, working till one in the morning. So it's all like different priorities that I focus on and shift all over the place. And so I don't ever think, I guess I, because it's never really balanced to me, uh, it's, it's just about shifting priorities and making decisions sometimes on the fly to actually do what's important at that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as a mother of three young children, um, every day is an adventure. Uh, balance was a big you know, statement that was put out there when I graduated from college. You have to find your balance, find your special place, figure it all out with the balance equation. I have not found balance at all. I've found great um, excitement, pleasure, enjoyment um, in having an adventure every day and being fortunate to have a husband who every day we look at it like a roller coaster. We're strapping in and we're going to do as well as we can. And some days we end up on the track and other days we're slightly off the track. Um, but we're going to get up the next morning and try as hard as we can. And then going to the office and having an amazing group of people that work with me on a team. And it's a similar adventure. You know, you think about you have these two lives. Um, you have your work family and you have your family family. And they're really important to, to understand the, you know, that when you go home at night, that family at the office is still <laughs> calling on you as much as the family at home is calling on you when you may be in the office. So um, every day is an adventure. I just I get excited by the fact that it's every day different. And um, balance is, to me, a myth. And it doesn't matter if you work or you stay home. Or you're a man or a woman, probably. Right. Yeah. right. Fair enough. Um, well, I think we have about five minutes left for questions from the audience. So now we'd like to open up the floor for questions. I think there are some mics um, down here in the front on either side of the, the aisles. Maybe we can have a lady take a risk and ask a question. Oh, good. Here we go. I'm loving this conversation in this event, so thank you. I wondered if you could comment a little bit about social media. So as chief marketing officers, obviously, you represent a brand, and we've been talking about building your own personal brand. So if you could talk a little bit about the personal social media channels that you're using, what are you using, how much are you um, doing on social media, things like that. I thank am you. obsessed with Twitter. Um, I only have 13,000 followers, so I'm having huge Kara Swisher envy right now. Um, she was making fun of Steve Chase with 300,000. It's that, you know. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I didn't see you there having Kara Swisher envy. Totally. There you go. I'll give you a baseball. Tim makes fun of me. I'm always, I do a lot of Twitter giveaways. I'm very cause related in my tweets, um, supporting our things. Yeah, I think it's very important in your life, whether you're working or you're not working, to look at what you're doing in social media and to be really smart about that because that is an extension of who you are. So I tweet professionally, which means that anything I do or say I know I'm representing an ambassador of Major League Baseball. Um, I do Facebook privately. It's been very uncomfortable when my work uh, peers have asked to friend me and I have not accepted their friends. I have about 100 friends and those are the people that I am okay with seeing me in a bathing suit. Um, so, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of, that's the line that delineates it for me. I think it's so important to understand, you know, everything that's going on with Snapchat and Twitter and Vine. And, and I think, again, it's just, as Anne pointed out earlier, you can really hear from your consumers, and that's data. It's not just social media. It's information and insights on your consumers, what they want, when they want it. And many of us, all of us on this panel, have the opportunity to impact change immediately. So I find it just really exciting, and I'm tweeting right after this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We've got a lot of it. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, go ahead. Um, yeah. So, so much like Jacqueline, I actually s spend a lot of time on social media for work-related purposes. Uh, most of the things that I tweet are all you know, about work in some way. Uh, a lot of the things I tweet about are about things that we're doing in the giving space, uh, because I know that our community actually cares a lot about that. Uh, and uh, as it relates to how I treat Facebook, um, Facebook I, is no longer about my personal friends and folks I went to school with. Those are the people I check on and I look at all their photos. But a lot of my Facebook friends are our sellers. I probably have 200 sellers uh, that I have Facebook friends on. So I understand what they're doing, what they care about, what's happening uh, with their accounts, with their businesses, uh, what they're doing, how they're doing it. 
uh, and it's a choice that I've made to kind of open that up. It, it kind of happened by mistake. You let one in and they all come in. Uh, and, uh, but it's really been incredible for me because it gives me a chance to stay connected to our eBay community in, in other ways. And, and I have a, as it relates to work, I have a pretty large uh, social media team and so they're doing a lot of other things as well that helps to amplify some of the things that I'm doing and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And I only use it professionally. I mean, we only use it uh, to market or, or to express something. I do, you would never find me beyond that. Uh, and at Bloomberg, social media is a huge, huge aspect of what we do. Uh, in fact, Bloomberg actually measures the social velocity now of companies and sort of how they're being discussed in the social media sphere and what that means for stock prices. So there's a lot being done and a lot being innovated with regards to social media right now. Right. We use social media for data purposes. I mean, and that, that's exactly right. Volume and tone um, mm -hmm. and specifics. Another question from the audience on this side. Hi, I'm Ayesha Hawk, and I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for being here today. It's wonderful to see amazing women talking to us. My question is regarding branding. Um, we mentioned briefly about how important branding is to get your message out there and to show people how you can help them and how you're an effective part of society or a company. Could you guys mention some things that we can do as young ladies to further our brand and discover it. You know, we mentioned that it's very difficult as college students to discover your brand, but what can we do to further that? Go ahead. And? Well, Michelle, you're in the middle, go ahead. I'm in the middle, okay. Um, so your, your personal brand matters. Uh, you, I think you have to really think about what you stand for, what you care about, what you want to be right. known for, uh, and as you do that, then that starts to cultivate uh, I think you have to uh, think about the causes you care about, the, the people you want to be connected to, and all of these things actually help to build who your brand is and what your brand does. Uh, and you know, so, so my head of HR always jokes, well, Rochelle, you're a brand, because I told her that on my first day. I'm like, I'm a brand. Uh, and so, um, it, but that's important because it, it defines the things that I end up doing. So my brand cares about women and women's issues, so I spend a lot of time focused on women and women's issues. My brand uh, cares about kind of cause and giving, and, and so I do a lot with um, the charitable, comp charitable component of our business. Uh, and my brand uh, cares about business and marketing and making sure that women have successes in, in, uh, in the lanes that I focus on. And so I know that's what's important to my brand, and, and those are the things that I touch, because time is so precious. You don't have that much of it, and so you have to be deliberate about the things that you wanna, that you wanna pay attention to. And so that's why you have to de really define what that is. And that's not to suggest that your brand won't change over time. Some of the best brands in the world have changed over time. Uh, but you have to kind of cultivate that. Jacqueline, Ann, do you have anything to add there? Well, I would just add, I think for, for at this point, you need people that will recommend you you have to know what your, something that you can bring to the party, your value, whether it's a talent or, or an expertise or a certain level of intellect with enthusiasm, and um, check that with, to see that those that would recommend you would say that and then have them recommend you because you're getting started. And um, that's, that's the value of networking. And you also have to accept if you think something and they aren't going to say it, that you've got to do a little self-evaluation of well, what do I need to fix? Uh, on the well, right course, too. Uh, I mean, you've aligned with Georgetown, so it's a great yeah, brand there you to are. start with. Yeah. Um, well, I, I've, unfortunately, we've run out of time today. Um, I want to thank the panelists for their time and this really interesting conversation. I'm sure we could continue it for hours. Um, but hopefully, if you have any additional questions, maybe we can stay here for a few minutes and answer them. But best of luck to all of you, and have a wonderful conference today. Thank you.